And with that, I'll take some questions. So UCL is considered part of the TFC or not, the TFC, TFCC or not. The TFCC is kind of a wastebasket. So everything goes in there. So the ulnar collateral ligament is in most circles considered part of the, the TFCC. It's not a critically important structure since it doesn't provide a lot of instability. It's usually used as an indirect sign of other things uh, that are happening, such as the case that I showed you. So the answer is it is. How reliable is various var variance assessment on MRI? Um, doesn't patient positioning affect this? It absolutely does. You'll notice in my slides, I didn't say ulnar variance positive. I said positive variance posture because hand surgeons are like neurosurgeons, detail oriented, thank God. OCD, not to a fault, they're OCD, thank God they are. So they are very specific about how they want their variants measured on conventional radiography. And that is why I use the term posture. However, you have an obligation to use a little bit of common sense. So let's say you're more than eight millimeters distal to the radius with your ulna. Look at what's happening around you. If the TFC is thin, if there's fluid in the radial articulation, if there is lunatochondromalacia, you have an obligation to call out that ulnar positive variance posture to protect yourself and say that the patient has secondary signs of ulno lunate abutment syndrome. So I absolutely use the secondary signs to put myself on sound footing as it relates to variance when dealing with hand surgeons who have very strict criteria for such. Um, which protocol would you recommend when evaluating a vitality of bone on MRI? For instance, in the case of Keenbox disease, or scaphoid fracture. Is T1 fat sat before and after contrast injection sufficient or the only examination that can get the optimal and realistic results when we use perfusion sequences? Well, first of all, I wouldn't do perfusion imaging if I have a uniform or nearly uniform black, slightly collapsed or markedly collapsed, you know, lunate. Now, if somebody, you know, has a normal size lunate, and it's an indeterminate keen box case, or they're trying to determine how much is viable and how much is not viable, which wouldn't be in a uniform black lunate, then I will do dynamic contrast imaging, just as I might do with say a breast MRI. I'll do very fast fat suppression gradient echo imaging, and um, you know maybe a slice every three seconds or so, you don't have to be too, too quick with it and look at how the lunate perfuses. How often do I do that? Maybe two to three times a year. I've done it a few times in the scaphoid as well, but, but it, isn't, it isn't standard practice for me, but that's the best way to do it. Kind of mimicking the dynamic breast protocol. Next, please. Any other question? How much physiologic fluid is there in the distal radial ulnar joint? I allow a slit. What's a slit? A millimeter of fluid. There's going to be some subjectivity there, but it's going to be a very, a very tiny amount. And it's also going to depend on patient age. For instance, if I have a 15-year-old, I don't want to see any fluid there. If I have a 50-year-old, I'll allow a millimeter of you know, lubricating fluid and you know, potential overuse and, and so on. You know, if, if I'm on the fence, I'm looking at everything else. I'm looking at the the volar and dorsal radial ulnar ligaments. I'm looking at the intrinsics. I'm looking at the adjacent uh, radial ulnar cartilage using indirect signs to make that decision. Next question, what is the significance of the space of Poirier? Well, the space of Poirier is this sort of weakness that occurs between those short volar blue ligaments that I drew for you that is kind of right in the middle, just volar to the capitate. It is important because it's an area of weakness and when you have these more advanced, complex instabilities, it will allow the capitate to come forward, it allow the capitate to drop down, and it can contribute to what you saw at the end, end-stage carpal tunnel syndrome. Orthopod tells you to look for ulnar collateral ligament injury. Where to look for it, and is there any significance? Well, I'm not sure um, an experienced hand surgeon would ever order an MRI for that purpose. We all know that do a lot of wrist imaging that the UCL is a flimsy structure. It is used by us as an indirect sign of other problems, retinacular stripping, ECU disease, 
and so on. But the best place to look for it is where I showed you on higher resolution coronal uh, imaging. And it doesn't necessarily matter which sequence, although I, I, I see it best on a one to two millimeter Fiesta sequence. How reliable is TFCC interpretation on films or on scans done in other places? Do you end up repeating such scans at your place? That's a loaded question. You know, we are a, a tertiary referrals facility. So we do get to see and resolve these usually without contrast. And um, MR is extremely reliable, extremely reliable. I, I hardly ever inject a risk to diagnose a TFC or a TFCC tear. The most common use of contrast for me is in an equivocal LT ligament injury. And that, that is not often. A next question um, about DISI and VISI. Uh, are there standard angles to measure the position of the lunate and scaphoid and capitate bones? There are. If you email me, I'll send you those angles. My, my pen is not working, but as a general rule of thumb, I like the scaphoid to have about a 45 to 60 degree position relative to the vertical. So if I start to see the scaphoid get below 45 degrees and start approaching the horizontal, then I know I have rotatory displacement. Regarding DISI and VISI, that's a little more easy. However, if the technologist puts the, the hand in the scanner and they do this, they ulnar deviate, you are going to create a DISI posture appearance, so-called pseudo DISI. So make sure that your wrist is absolutely straight. And if it is, your lunate should be pointed straight up towards the capitate and straight up towards the base of the third metacarpal. Um, let's see. Question about the ECU. Is the ECU part of the TFCC? It is, as is its subsheet. All right. Are there any other questions? 1.5 versus 3T. Which one is preferable? They're both fine. Absolutely. And you can scan with low field in the wrist because you can get the hand in the center of the magnet bore. So if you can do the right sequences, STIR, then section gradient echo imaging, SARGE, you know, one, two millimeter slices, you absolutely can image the wrist at low field as low as 0.18 Tesla. Okay, I think I have answered all the questions. Doesn't patient positioning affect the ability to assess DISI? I think I answered that one. You absolutely need to have the wrist straight. If you ulnar deviate, you're gonna create pseudo DISI. If you radial deviate, you're going to create pseudo visi. All right. I think that's about it. Thank you for your thoughtful questions. And I hope to see you all in September for the combined uh, Resnick, Pomerantz, Chung, and colleagues course. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you. Have a great day.